And I have the distinct honor of being on the advisory committee for Besides Nova, now what, the second year? I sort of helped out the first year. I also have the honor of working with clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com. That's sort of the job that pays for me to travel to six to ten of the B-sides throughout the community. And I really have to commend Sophia and her organizers for another fabulous event. If you didn't know, all B-sides events are run by volunteers. Very passionate people within the community who said, we want to make a difference. We want to bring people together for networking. We want to bring them together to learn skills. We want to bring them together to share and get over some of the challenges that many of us have. What's interesting is that B-Sides as a movement has moved globally. There are over 350 B-Sides around the world. There are other committed individuals like yourselves who are going on Saturdays to meet with other hackers to solve problems and to really make recommendations to make the world a better place. And we have one person, many people, but one person in particular to thank for this movement. And I, it's my honor to introduce Jack Daniel, one of the co-founders of B-Sides, and I'm really excited that he's here in my hometown to give us his talk on why B-Sides is so important. Thank you, Jack. So uh, the point of that was, I don't know what you're expecting, but it's probably not this. Um, <laughs> um, So this is two parts, a little introduction, and we'll get into the meat of it. But I'd like to start uh, talking about B-Sides and, and what they are. And start out with, you know, welcome to B-Sides. Uh, you are here in Herndon, Virginia. And that's amazing. This is a fantastic event. Does it, Sophia and crew have done a fantastic job. All the speakers and sponsors and all of you who come in and participate and make it what it is. Uh, but the important thing is that, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, it's you're part of this, but you're also part of this. You're part of something that is coast to coast across North America. And you're also part of this. Uh, the question marks are probable events coming up uh, in the next year or so. Green dots are first time event cities that are coming up in the next several months. Blue Dots have held an event. Um, in July of 2009, a handful of us kind of got together and did a one-off event to bring voice to interesting content and support conversations in the community. Uh, that one-off event uh, sparked some things. This is event number 388 globally since July of 2000. Um, B-Sides events have been held in 101, uh, 121 cities in 36 countries around the world. Earned dates for 45 more events are already uh, on the calendar for this year, and there will be quite a few probably across the 80 event per year mark this year. There were 78 last year. Uh, I've had conversations with people uh, spinning up first-time events in... Uh, Cairo, um, Rome just had one, Milan is coming up, Trento, Italy, Harare, Zimbabwe. Those two, uh, Cairo and Harare, these are people of places that have some challenges to be kind. And the information security community is coming together, the hacker crowd is coming together and be like, look, we can't solve everything, but let's do this thing for us in our community. And uh, whether that's here in Northern Virginia or if it's in Harare, Zimbabwe, uh, it's an amazing thing to be part of. One of the things I like to talk about in this rapid growth is a lot of events. Um, I, I won't make fun of ours. Okay, I won't make fun of ours. It, it's a big deal to uh, you know get your alumni badge or whatever. I've been doing for 10 years. But we're a growing community. Besides, is a growing community. A hacker community is a growing community. 
InfoSec is a growing industry, and those of us that care about it are a growing community. And when you have a growing organization, you need a growing foundation. So whether this is your first ever event or, like me, the 70th B-sides that you've attended, uh, you're part of the Founder Circle, and thank you for joining us to uh, be part of the Founder Circle. So uh, one thing, I have a reputation as a curmudgeon, which I cherish, but sometimes I do get a little idealistic. Uh, how many people here, is this your first hacker security conference event? That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, now to follow through on what this slide's about. You can do that. That's not difficult. You definitely give them your own business card, not mine, but <laughs> <laughs> that's how we uh, do this. So on to um, this, this topic. Um, I, have, I have really bad news for those of you who, like me, are infosec pros. You're you're experts. You're ninja hackers. We're also actual human beings, and shit that happens to humans happens to you. Um, uh, by the way, this laptop and I and this version of PowerPoint spend so much time together, it's become sentient, and my own slide decks heckle me. Uh, but what I mean by that is I'm going to talk about coping skills for dealing with stress and dealing with some other issues that are part of what we do. And if nobody gets any value out of it, that means none of you are battling stress or burnout or depression. And none of you work with people who are battling with stress, uh, which would mean all of you have large teams of well-trained, experienced people who are happy. Uh, <laughs> right, okay, and that's the nervous laughter that I expect when I say something like that. So, uh, why this topic? I have an amazing job. I have just an unbelievably fantastic job, uh, and I hope that you do too. Um, I love my job. I, I work for Tenable, and they let me do uh, all sorts of things to build community for the industry. I work with these sides and have since the beginning. But, you know, some jobs aren't great. Uh, Hey, when your love of technology is unrequited. <laughs> Hello, this is Danny, in house psychologist for Norton Corp. Danny, I'm sick of typing. I want to quit, but I don't know how I'd support myself if I did. Well, ask yourself this question What is it that you really enjoy about typing? Are you still there? I don't like anything about typing. Every morning when I get ready for work, I start crying. What's wrong with me? You hate your work. It's normal. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't have great jobs, and even those of us that do, you know, a life is more than work or should be. Uh, we need to be prepared. And, you know, this is a... An area full of entrepreneurs, it's full of managers, it's full of people who are working in teams. And it's not just about us, it's about those around us. This is a quote that I love from Dan Gear. Um, And if Dan feels that way, uh, I'm screwed. You know, let's, let's be honest. If Dan Gear can't keep up, we're kind of in trouble. And some uh, some folks have some stress in their work. Um, Joey posted this a couple of years ago. Uh, I thought it was telling. Uh, ever worked a case that bothered you? I drink a lot. Forty percent of three hundred plus respondents. That's how they handle DFIR. Huh? That's not great. 
Let's try technology again. Everybody must get uh, Yes, everybody must get on. You may, you, you may have heard there's been some breaches in the past two years. Um, so we're sort of up against some hard stuff. Where does that leave us? You know, um, this, this is kind of what we feel like in InfoSec. On the good days, on the bad days, it's a little bit more like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe that was a little harsh. Perhaps we need a kitten to make it better, you know, like kitty face palm, but it's still a face palm. So how do we feel? Um, it, it's not just about coping. It's, it's about... And it's not just about survival, it's about thriving. We want to thrive. We want to be good at it. We want to enjoy what we do. We love challenges, although some of you that are new to this are finding out you got into it because you liked challenges. You were kind of thinking maybe not this many, this complex, this fast. But, you know, it's, it's, we like to think. It's cool. We want to thrive. Um we're trying to have a better life than not ending up flatlining in the hospital from stress. Um, I've done some talks uh, years ago on uh, the, the severe end of burnout, and I actually got calls from uh, I got a call from somebody in the hospital who couldn't come to the talk because stress had triggered, and uh, they wouldn't let him leave London and, as a matter of fact, took him to the hospital. Um, so we don't want to do that. We want to actually enjoy life. Uh, and so then the disclaimer here, um, I'm not an expert. I have been talking to people and listening to people and doing informal research for almost a decade on stress and burnout and coping with things and how to be efficient and effective in our industry and in life in general. Um, but I get lost at times. And one of the things that I've realized recently is all the stuff that I've done and the number of people that I work with and share ideas with. I have started seeing a counselor because I was talking to her at first Friday, a little artsy thing that we have in town, like most, like many cities. And um, her chat, and I was like, hey, you know, maybe I should see you guys sometime. I started doing this amateur caregiver thing, and we started talking about some of the issues that those of us who are open uh, in our industry to uh, talking to and pretty much uh, dragged me into her office and said, we need to talk. Uh, because being an amateur caregiver is kind of a dumb idea, but if you care about people, you do it. But it's uh, it's a thing. So uh, I'm not an expert, but I try really hard, and sometimes I think I make a difference. Uh, one of the things about stress, stress will tear up your memory like you wouldn't believe. Um, and the older you get, every stress cycle you go through, your memory bounces back a little less each time. I have hundreds of post-it notes. There are usually a dozen scattered around my house, pads of post-it notes, pen and paper, paper everywhere. There are whiteboards everywhere. I never travel without having two phones, both of which have a myriad of note-taking apps, a laptop with note-taking apps, and, of course, a spiral notebook for notes. Uh, because otherwise I don't know anything. Uh, and I've been through some stressful things in life. I'm in a pretty good place now. Uh, but, you know, that's a dramatic impact. Stress screws with your memory. Um, if you work in this industry, there's stuff you need to remember. I mean, you know, there, there are other things like asking Git how to, I'm mean, asking Google how to undo a Git commit. So, you know, so, hey, how does that work again? Or, you know, things that we do a hundred times. But Google can't solve all of our problems. Another thing that contributes to our stress is none of us, uh, a lot of people in our industry have a problem with imposter syndrome. I have no idea why you people are here listening to me right now. I, I don't get it. I am an intermittently entertaining old fart, uh, but I'm glad you're here, so I'm, I'm giving this a go. Uh, and it's very common. And then what really frustrates a lot of us that care is at the other end of the spectrum, there are a lot of people that get a lot of air cover in this industry who um, need to visit their proctologist to get an eye exam because their head needs to be pulled out of their butt. Um, and so they don't know how dumb they are. And we deal with that. And um, sometimes there are bosses. Uh, not mine right now, uh, but I've been there. So a little bit more going on. There are three words that you need to know. This is sort of the clinical um, 
burnout, stress stuff, psychology. The words are uh, efficacy, personal efficacy, how, how well you think you're doing your job. And by the way, that doesn't mean you think InfoSec is winning the battle against the bad guys. It means you think you're personally effective. And that's a good thing, the more you feel like. Um, exhaustion is the other one. This is physical as well as mental exhaustion. And uh, then the third one in our industry for pre uh, professionals don't work with people as what they do. Uh, it's uh, cynicism. If you were a social worker or medical professional, it would be depersonalization where you stop caring about the people you're involved with. And cynicism, um, in the research that we've done, formal and informal, we've discovered that cynicism is a core competency of information security. Uh, that's bad because exhaustion um, and cynicism are bad things uh, in excess. But I got to say this as a cynic, um, George Carlin, <laughs> inside every cynical person, is a disappointed idealist. And I'm going to give that a few people in this audience uh, just had a little twitch of uh, self recognition there. Um, but some of us did a study years ago on, on uh, burnout, and a couple others have done it. And one of the things that I thought would be interesting is to take a look at the patterns of the people who weren't suffering from stress and burnout. And uh, it, it, uh, there were no patterns. Uh, you know, you know, it's one of those data science things. I have data, and I have science. I have no results. <laughs> wow. Uh, blockchain it. No. Um. <laughs> uh, I like uh, storytelling and metaphors and analogies, and they're all terrible. But who wants some coffee? We thrive on coffee, right? So tell me about here's this journey. Happy little coffee beans out in the mountains, sun's shining, the rain's on them, it's pleasant. Um, and then somebody comes by and plucks you up and throws you in a truck and takes you off somewhere and you get roasted and then ground and then put in a machine where they add extreme heat and pressure and then you're expected to perform and deliver some magical goodness. Just kind of like a cubicle farm at work, right? Extreme heat and pressure, and, um, roast, grind, hot water, and then what comes out could be like this magical elixir of life that keeps many of us going. And sometimes it takes, you know, you have to have decent water and you have to have decent beans, and the beans have to have been treated properly and handled well. And maybe we need some sweetener, or creamer, or flavorings, or maybe you know, a splash or a few ounces of frangelico to get the morning going dark rum, um, but those, you know, that, that creamer or sweetener or whatever, uh, you know, that's, that's the coffee, the poor little coffee beans coping skills, and it, it kind of looks like this if you apply it to people. Uh, we have our burdens and we have our coping skills, and then we reach burnout and impact, and the point is to stay above the red line, you know, to, to turn to that, but basically... Um, I figured I'd do some research about a year and a half ago, and it was amazing. Um, I, I thought it was really up for some hardcore research, so I asked on Twitter. Because, um, you know, where are you going to get more reliable data than that? Um, you'd have to ask Putin himself. So, uh, I don't know. No, wait, no, we're not going there. Not going there. So I got a lot of answers. Almost a thousand people reached out to me. Uh, publicly, privately, through a whole myriad of channels. And some shared uh, one or two word answers, and some shared paragraphs and had long email exchanges about how they coped with work. Stress, stress in life, stress in work. Um, there were some interesting ones. Um, this was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things became obvious. Um, there are big stressors and little stressors, and the way people respond to them turns out to be really important. And context matters. So I dug up some pictures I took years ago for a very different presentation to, to kind of make this point. Context really matters. You need to understand your situation, what you're up against. Uh, some of you may know, I am a native Texan, born and raised in Texas, uh, and it's an awesome thing because I don't live there anymore. Um, 
but I am a native Texan, which does give me an excuse for any aberrant behavior that I exhibit for the rest of my life. Uh, what the? I, Texan. Okay. Uh, don't worry, the rest of you, uh, there is a, an ancient Aztec word uh, for a substance that makes you temporarily Texan. It's called tequila. It's awful. But anyway, uh, so here we have a uh, redneck pickup truck with a cherry picker in the bed and a pro Texas secession bumper sticker on that, and that's a pretty clear message. We get this, right? Especially if you're in Northern Virginia. Not real Virginia, we're in Northern Virginia. Um, so this is a clear message that we understand, like when we venture out to Culpeper, we meet these people, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, the context matters because when you see the Massachusetts license plate, <laughs> that actually means in stale. Uh, what am I saying? So there are big problems and little problems, and sometimes uh, you need to take a big step, and other times a big step might be fatal. Uh, what have I seen there? I've seen people who job hop because they have no short-term small problem coping skills, and so they just hit the eject button every nine months to two years because they can't deal with minor stuff. Uh, and then I see people spend uh, 22 years and 10 months in the car business because they have really good short-term coping skills, and then finally can't take it anymore, and then I got out. Uh, and so that's... <laughs> <clears throat> and I should have pulled that button, I have pulled that cord long ago, even though I was doing technology and security in the car business. These are awful people. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with the stereotypes of the auto industry, it's way too kind. They don't deserve that much. But anyway, uh, common answers. Again, these are the ones from Twitter, so they must be right. So we got a bunch that I were kind of disappointing. Uh, you know, how do you cope? Uh, I, badly, not always, not at all well, poorly, cry, rant. But there were some interesting things. The number two thing can be lumped into this category of do something, preferably outdoors. So that's hit the gym, go fishing, go camping, go hiking, rock climbing, bicycling, go for a walk, anything, especially if it gets outdoors. Years ago when I worked support, worked firewall support, and as we all know, it's always the firewall's fault. Uh, no, it's not. By the way, as a firewall guy, no, it's the ISP's fault. Uh, footnote and or DNS. Um, <laughs> Uh, put, put those three together, firewalls, DNS, and the ISP. It's a miracle we have an internet at all. I used to uh, reach uh, epic stress levels in the afternoon dealing with people who, you know, didn't understand things. And they'd be like trying to, whatever, they'd try to do things. And I would try to help. I would reach a point where I just had to get up. And I'd get up and I'd walk like uh, 150 yards from our office building to the Starbucks and get another six-shot latte and walk back. And I felt a lot better, but I wasn't really any calmer after doing six shots of espresso at two in the afternoon. But, you know, I felt better. Um, so anything like that, get up, go for a walk, go outside. Another one that was a big thing for people, whether they were creating or listening or what they're seeing it live or just jamming the uh, headset on was music. Yeah. So whether you're into uh, cheesy soft rock from the 70s or maybe a little uh, punkage uh, sonics from the 60s, free punk, uh, whatever you listen to, music is amazing. And there are a lot of people that for whom music uh, is a salvation, both for the isolation it can provide you from your cubicle farm to other things. Uh, and it varied. A lot of people like to create music. I don't have the ears for creating music, so I have yet to even like master the MP3 player. Um, it should, it should be easier, but I have an iPhone. And there's iTunes, which is... Um, oh, that AAC, where's 
I have damaged hearing from being a mechanic for many years and the Dick Dale concerts, and I can still find the missing music in AAC. Um, and now everything's pitch and tone, tempo corrected, overproduced pop crap. But, but enough of that. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but if you enjoy it, go for it. Find what turn, you know, find what works for you. And you know, there's some people for whom music is uh, ridiculously important. Uh, and uh, we tend to gravitate together, even those of us that are talentless. Um, but, you know, if that's your thing, find it and, and own it, you know. And, and my, my tastes are very eclectic. I'll go from extremes like 60s French pop to, you know, death metal and things like that and back. But uh, maybe, maybe a little punk. So, uh, yeah, here we go. I'm going to uh, hurl the speaker in a river on the way home, I think. Uh, it's worked for years, it's done. So, drugs, legal, this one came up a lot. Uh, in places where it's legal and people don't have federal career considerations, marijuana is a big thing. Um, and uh, in places where that's not true, it's still a big thing. Um, legal or not, a lot of different things came up. Uh, and for some people, you know, under the prescription of uh, medical professional, there are some things that help with focus and other things. But uh, you know, this was a big answer. And whether or not it's the right answer, I should, you know, I'm, you, you can make some judgments about my age and when I grew up. So um, I'm pretty boring these days. I probably drink more than I should, but I don't know a lot. But, no, I drink more than I should. That's it. That's where I draw the line. It's fine. I'm not judgmental. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Um, I'm, I'm non-judgmental as long as you're not hurting yourself or anybody else. Um, alcohol was by far the number one answer that I got. We drink too much. Uh, the good news is most of us feel bad about it. Is that? Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, I know I shouldn't, but I drink a lot. <laughs> Uh, so this is an issue we have, and I just want to, I'm not going to dwell on this, I'm not going to beat anybody up, but here's one of the things to be aware of with the alcohol. You see people at events like DEFCON or RSA, um, or even InfoSecurity Europe, or besides Vegas, or ShmooCon, or DerbyCon, and you see a lot of drinking. What we don't always know is whether that person um, makes an ass out of themselves once or twice a year, or if that's the way they are every night, and we don't know that until it's too late. That's one of the things that concerns me. Uh, so just be aware of it. Uh, friends and family, this is really cool. Mutual support is amazing. The challenge is, of course, that if it's one-sided, if you're always the caregiver, um, it gets tiring. And if you're the one always needing care, you find yourself isolated as you burn out people. Uh, but friends and family is how we get through. We're going to talk a little bit more about something about this that's kind of interesting. Uh, disconnect and unplug is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest ones that people said. I know it's hard, uh, but disconnecting from life, unplugging is, uh, is a big deal. To, you know, baby steps. Uh, complete tangent here, but not really. I, uh, yeah, well, we won't, we'll save that tangent for later. But, you know, you can, and I'm admitting my own, I do actually disconnect as I stand here with an iPhone in my pocket, an iPhone in my bag, an uh, Apple watch on my wrist, and a laptop in front of me. It's possible to disconnect. So uh, it helps. If uh, you were more trusting, if I trusted technology, I would expect this to work. But we're going to try and tell this works. Mm -hmm. If you were more trusting, I would ask you to close your eyes and go on a little trip with me. That happens to be uh, on Scott Rail, going across the Western Highlands, through the mountains, just enjoying life. Or I spoke with my wife a few years ago. Um, or maybe you could come down. I, I lived in Georgia now, down on the coast. Maybe you could, you know, come join me for a walk on the beach. Yeah. 
You know, a little bit. Just get away. Now, one or two of you would figure this out, if not more. Of course, I am a hypocrite, because in those moments, I took out my phone and recorded those sounds, because I knew they'd be good for a presentation. Uh, so, I own my hypocrisy. Thank you for me. Uh, but, I make these sacrifices for you. I'm a guy. I can rationalize the shit out of anything. <laughs> uh, uh, so, anyway, and yes, you have to take baby steps, because when you come back, it turns out people don't stop sending you emails and text messages while you're disconnected. Uh, you need triage. Actually, that's one of the things that, for me, the Apple Watch does. It's like, huh. Nope, I don't care. I don't have the cycles today to care. Trash. Nope, don't care. Oh. This involves paychecks or my love life. I'm going to respond, right? And, or, or not, again, depending. A um, few more answers. Uh, mindfulness and meditation. Uh, for those that are scattered, uh, productivity tools help a lot of people, even though they're not correct. If you're better organized, you're better able to function. Um, pets. A lot of people get a lot of enjoyment out of their pets. A uh, variety of hobbies. Video games. This one's kind of tricky. If you live at a computer and then go home and live at a computer, ask yourself if it's actually okay. I'm not going to say it is or isn't. I'm just going to say think about that. Um, I skipped the second one here. This is stunningly rare. Professional therapy. And whether that professional therapy is a counselor, a psychologist, psychiatrist, a uh, bartender, a priest, rabbi, pastor, whatever. I doubt, by the way, do this to bartenders. If you do tip really, really well, they're not your therapists. Um, uh, but um, if you find the right ones, and it can be hard uh, to find the right ones that will uh, do that. But that's one that uh, you know, a lot of folks turn to. Sometimes it's uh, the beauty of a therapist is that you just tell them stuff. And a lot of times when you're in good shape, uh, you just tell them stuff, and they don't say anything, and they let you listen to your own words. It's like, ah, huh. When I say it out loud, that seems like a really dumb thing to do. And then they won't call you a dumbass, which is really great. It's just for being dumb, they want you to come back and keep admitting you're a dumbass without actually them having to tell you. Um, there were some edge cases. I don't know how serious these were. Carving cameo images of dead emperors and cream of Oreo cookies and realism. Uh, the peanut butter one uh, I thought was a joke at first, then I realized the guy that submitted that to me does live in Australia, so that could be a thing. Uh, uh, redneck golf. Uh, we, we are somewhere with a lot of folks that have uh, interesting to. Um, and then we're going to do one where we get a little bit personal. So there are things that happen in your life that make you reassess what's important to you. Um, sometimes you get married. Sometimes you have a kid. Sometimes your marriage dissolves. Sometimes your parents get sick or die. Things happen in life. Sometimes you build a company and it collapses around you and sell it for pennies on the dollar if you get that much. Things happen which hit you really hard. If you are not prepared for them, they can end your career and make you miserable. Think about what happens when life doesn't go well. But the upside is if you come out the other side, you're going to be a lot less likely to be as wound up about stuff you shouldn't be wound up about. Um, I don't encourage you to seek out uh, devastation in your life, but a lot of people come out either utterly broken or uh, better able to cope with life. Uh, I will say that this often takes a couple of cycles. Uh, when I was in my 30s and lost my mom, uh, that didn't even slow me down because I was a 32-year-old. Damn. Damn. Those people are invincible. Um, and this is where it gets personal. So a couple of years ago, 14 months ago, I lost my wife. My wife and I met when she was 14 and I was 15 and we were together for 40 years and I lost her over in Um Anybody care to guess how much technology meant to me last year? 
Anybody care to guess how much the people in my life and the people that I touch through B-sides and everything else I do went to me last year? <laughs> that's it. Now, that's cool if you have the most amazing job with the most supportive corporation that you've ever worked with and an amazing group of friends that you can swing to from one to the other. Uh, most people don't have that luxury. Uh, I've come out the other side, and I, but now technology for me is what technology can do for you and people that use it. I still play with corporate products in the lab. I still do things, but it's changed. I am forever changed. Uh, that's awesome in some ways if you can get away with it. A lot of people can't. And if you happen to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur doing a tech startup and technology becomes boring for you, it kind of changes your world. Um, now, what may happen is you may realize this is a really cool idea, but unless I have it so my, people, my users can actually use the product without cursing my name every time they log in, maybe the end result is good. But, um, you know, this is the thing that I've heard over and over again is that extreme perspective readjustments happen. Uh, they do give you a sense of balance. So, um, some general common sense. Don't chase face challenges alone. On this later. Uh, don't make the people that work for and with you face challenges alone. We're special. It's okay. uh, one of the things that comes up over and over and over again is do more stuff. This seems counterintuitive. But you have to do stuff that you want to do, stuff that's satisfying, things that are rewarding. Uh, volunteer, mentor, speak, teach, share, help people. Don't overcommit yourself. I've heard that some people are serial volunteers and get in way over their head, sleep several hours a week because of it. Um, Maybe that's me, uh, but uh, I, I get an enormous amount of value out of it, um, and I, you know, do cut back. And I do sometimes take a Benadryl, melatonin, and ibuprofen nap so that I can actually sleep. I don't recommend that either, but you know, sometimes. Uh, but do things that you find satisfying, and if you give a talk on something, if you mentor somebody on something, it turns out that uh, you have to learn more about it to teach something. It's amazing. And mentorship is one of the best ways to spot your own hypocrisy because you'd be like, hey, uh, I've been in that situation and the one thing that you don't want to do is this. Yeah, no, really, seriously, that's not the way to do it. And, uh, you know, if you, to just no, if I ever find myself in that situation again, I'll do it right this time. As you're in that situation. So, um, you know, it's healthy. Uh, learn something new, but education is work. Education is work. It's got to be worth it. Uh, you have to enjoy what you're learning or be able to leverage it into something you enjoy or a better job. Here's one that happens in the hacker crowd a lot. You are not an iPhone hacker. You're not a Google Nest thermostat hacker. You are you. You are a person. You are not your job. You are not your skill. You aren't the Internet of Things toaster hacker. You are you. You have skills. You know things. You do things. They evolve over time. Horrible things happen to people, like they end up in management. But, you know, they survive. So, you know, talking a little bit about people in your teams, uh, you know, this, this thing they tell you on the airplane every time, um, put on your own mask before helping others. You need to be in a good place to help others, and if you're not, you're not going to help them well. Uh, so as a manager or employer, again, I like to ask this, do you have too many qualified, trained employees, and do you find it easy to hire them? Um, well, perhaps you should look for people who aren't old white dudes uh, and pay them decently, that'll help some, but there's more to it than that. I just, sorry, just had to editorialize a bit. <laughs> um, but moving on about the, oh man, that's too many words. Um, if you can influence your situation and your organization, uh, you're not going to burn out. If your people can have some influence in their space, they're less likely to burn out. If you undermine your staff's autonomy, they don't perform well. They get cynical and distant. None of us have ever worked with anybody cynical and distant in InfoSec, have we? <laughs> A sense of control enhance engagement with work. Um, if you want to torture somebody without torturing them, 
Think about the way you handle generals and heads of state when their countries are overthrown. You put them in a suite. Give them three hours of television a day, and they never know what three hours they are. They get three gourmet meals a day. They never come at the same time. Um, they get an interview every day. It never happens at the same time. Interview is a jerk. Uh, but housekeeping, those those poor ladies are, um, you know, they're just sweethearts, and they're just cleaning up, bringing the food, and go on. Eventually, they are so sick of being abused, they start talking to the maid as she makes the bed or rolls the cart in with the food. And, of course, those are the actual intelligence analysts uh, because they are so unhinged from having no control over their environment that they start talking. Uh, <laughs> nobody ever feels that way like you're just, like, yanked around. Over. Anyway, um, provide feedback. Manage workloads. Uh, work distribution. Let people disconnect. You maybe even force it. Offer education. Oh, I'm gonna do this one too. Old cliche. I, I hope it is actually true. But you know, we've seen the cartoon. If you haven't, cartoon of two executives talking. What if we train our folks and they leave? The other executive says, "What if we don't and they stay?" We've worked with those people too. Uh, back to this. You aren't a professional, so don't act like one. Uh, you can be a friend, a mentor, or a peer. Uh, again, you know, Bob Dylan had something to say about this. I will not feel so alone. So, uh, feeling alone, listening to people, reaching out to people in touch. Do a little on this. Uh, last week, there was an on-point radio broadcast on the loneliness of it. One of the people on it was Vivek Murthy, uh, our former U.S. Surgeon General. Here's a bit of a quote. Um, most common pathology he saw was loneliness. Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, if you are isolated and lonely, um, we still have our lizard brains from being in the savannah and not having tools to fight off things that would eat us. That's why fight or flight is still a battle, and it's a challenge in modern day. It's a challenge to teaching people because we scare them until they stop using their prefrontal cortex, and then we can't get them to think logically. Um, if you feel isolated, even if it's a little bit, you feel lonely. Uh, you're out there in the you're out there in the plains, and you don't have anybody on your back. And somewhere at the top of your spinal column, your brain knows this. And you are a step or several closer to fight or flight all the time. You're in a stress state, and it has negative impacts on your physical health, not just mental health. If you're interested, uh, just reference later, but uh, September's Harvard Business Review, the cover story is from uh, Dr. Murthy, former vice admiral. Um, many employees, half of CEOs, feel lonely in their roles. Reduces task performance, limits creativity. Uh, so let's talk about this. One of the things that is uh, critical is, you know, again, back to contacts. Knowing what it is that really matters to you so that when life comes at you, you can focus on what matters to you. So let's try again. Make some music happen. <laughs> So, BB uh, King, this is the uh, Gibson Lucille. You can buy one of these at Guitar Center or whatever. It's an interesting axe if you're into guitars. I have no musical talent, but I do enjoy electrics. Uh, e yes, most people say 335. It's actually a 355. He was one of the few people that played a stereo electric guitar. Uh, that's a stereo axe. Uh, you can buy one like that. Um, and if you've ever been to like hard rock cafes or other places, you probably, you, you might have seen the guitar on the wall that said it was Lucille. And it was. Uh, in the winter of 1949, King played at a uh, dance hall in Twist, Arkansas. As was often the case, this was just sort of a, a wood building thrown up rather crudely, but it was still you know, a dance hall, bare wood. And heat was provided by putting a 55-gallon steel drum in the middle of the floor, filling it about halfway with kerosene and lighting it on fire. 
Some of you are already doing the math on having a giant bucket of kerosene in the middle of a wooden structure. Um, this, this doesn't have a happy ending. Um, spoiler. Uh, during a performance, BB and his band were on stage and two guys started fighting. And they hit the barrel, and the barrel fell over and spilled, you know, 20, 30 gallons of burning kerosene across the bare wood floor. Um, it ended badly. Uh, the band runs out to the car. BB realizes his brand new $35 guitar, $35 guitar is still on stage, runs back into the flaming building, grabs his guitar, runs back out, they all pile into the car, drive off. Next night, they're getting ready for the next show in the next town over, and they hear about what had happened. Two people had died. Um, and the two guys that were fighting were fighting over a woman, a woman named Lucille. That guitar and every guitar he owned from 1949 until his death a couple of years ago was named Lucille to remind him never to do anything that stupid again in his life. Don't run in for a guitar into a burning building. That's dumb. Lucille is immortalized uh, by this story. Um... And so when you see those, B.B. King, one of the greatest guitarists that ever lived, needed a guitar. He did not need that guitar, and he lived that. It's like, that's why there are blue seals all over the world. He played them for a while, and when they weren't pretty anymore, he'd buy another one. Or actually, Gibson would like send him truckloads of them. His guitar mechanic would tune it up. He'd play time until it was happy. And off you go. So, um, you know, if you're Dick Dale, you need that that axe that uh, the offender hand built for you. But if you're um, if you're BB, you know, huh. so you got to figure out whether you need a Lucille or the Lucille, what it is that you need in your life. And with that, let's go to some sources. No, not sources of stress. Those are ways to get stressed out. Let's move forward. Um, it's, it's pop psychology, but there's a, an annual report called um, Stress in America. Um, kind of read it with a filter on. You know, I mean, it's 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 way more truthful than like a Ponemon report, but still put the filter on. Um, sorry. Uh, Christina Moslock and Michael Leiter are the, the people who did the original stress and burnout work, and it's still some work if you really want to drill into stress and burnout. Uh, Professor Sapolsky has done some interesting stuff with stress and the impacts it has on us. Um, a few months ago, in last year, there were some interesting episodes of Southern Pride Security Podcast, as well as the Rally Security Podcast. Uh, infosanity.org is a handful of resources. There's a Slack channel, all those things that may uh, be of some value to you. And what I mentioned, uh, September uh, Harvard Business Review article on the loneliness epidemic uh, that our former uh, search general wrote uh, is a good resource. If you have an hour to kill, grab the on-point uh, radio episode of NPR.org for uh, this epidemic last week. A handful of folks talking about phys physical as well as uh, issues of loneliness because, hey, it turns out it turns out that we've got a lot of people who work remote, and when we're not remote, we're in a cute farm with our earphones on and isolated. And um, it's it's a thing, and especially if you're an employer, uh, there's some good stuff about how you should uh, think about getting people to work together. This is not just the bad stuff. He talked about the teams that he worked with uh, to improve communications and the connections with him. With that, I'm going to do a little shameless self-promotion. Another one of my projects, Shoulders of InfoSec. This is a crappy wiki full of people that found that our industry and it's expanding. Uh, wondering why we do what we do and who these people are. Uh, there are some newer folks that are making the list. It starts off with uh, probably Neville Maskelin, arguably the first uh, electronic hacker uh, a century ago. Maskelin did a wireless man in the middle on Marconi, up to much more recent people. So if you're into uh, history, we have an interesting industry that uh, whenever you join, we all run to keep up and we never look back. So I'm interested in that. And then the true shameless uh, stuff on Twitter, you might have heard that. And then apparently people are amused by my little, uh, my little project. It's a uh, cyber private eye. Uh, I have a lot of fun. It's in no way autobiographical. Well, right. um, but anyway, it is, it is that. And with that... Um, I'm easy to find on the internet thing. Find me and I'll give you a card. But really, you can find me. Uh, if you need to talk, just know that I am an amateur and my travel schedule is nuts. So I may not respond right away. 
So we call the drugstore and they say, if it's an emergency, call 911. Don't call me in an emergency. But if you want some of these resources or want to talk about stuff, let me know. And um, together we can make things better. Now, this is the end of my presentation, but there's more coming later today. And you're making connections here. Hopefully you're meeting new people and becoming better connected with people around you. And therefore, while I'm going to leave the stage and suffering bastard is as well, uh, this is the beginning. So thank you very much. Does it have to be advice I took? Because it would probably it would probably be don't do that. Uh, <laughs> it would be don't do that. Um, uh, not really advice, but I will say this: I learned uh, I learned three lessons in the car business, um, and uh, two were valuable. Um, but the one that is most valuable is I was young and bearded and ponytailed and working on French cars, and we were acquired by a Cadillac dealer, and a typical elderly Cadillac customer was having trouble with something. And I like, very cautiously inched up to her to try to figure out how to help her, um, but I didn't want to scare her away because she was obviously terrified. Uh, but I was able to help her figure out something with her new Cadillac, and she was very grateful. And the owner of the, uh, the chain of dealerships that I worked in at that time uh, was watching from his office, which uh, so he came down from the second floor and thanked me. He, I said, just trying to help her out, but I knew she was a little freaked out by the looking kid, so I, I wanted to be careful. But, you know, she just, just bought a Cadillac from us. And looked at me and said, that's, that's right. I wish more people understood this. Everyone is in sales. We all hate that. But you're selling ideas or products or services or yourself to the hiring manager. And sales doesn't have to be an evil word. Now, if you're, if you have the um, Sandler sell to me white patent leather shoes and matching belt mentality, that's a problem. But you're trying to communicate with people and communicate ideas. And it's grossly oversimplified, but everybody's in sales. Very quickly, the other two are, you can adjust it for what model of car and what year it is. Um, when you pay $135,000 for that BMW M series, don't believe the salesman. You're, they're not throwing the floor mats in for free. Critical eye about money. And the other one was, um, I was told by a, a representative from one of the factories that... Um, was it a, as a business con, a business seminar for uh, probably Chrysler? They would be the ones to say this back then. Uh, that sincerity is the key to success in business, because once you can fake that, you have it made, which, which sums up the car business for you. <laughs> yeah, we have, somebody has a question. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, it's Frankie's Tiki Room in Las Vegas, but there are some other great ones around. I'm a huge fan of Lost Lake in Chicago. Um, uh, well, uh, there are a couple in the L.A. area, uh, but in San Francisco, um, Smuggler's Cove and the Tonga Room, for very different reasons. Smuggler's Cove, amazing cocktails, amazing rum selection, the biggest in the world. Uh, very cool. Tonga Room is old school. It's, you know, boat in the basement. What used to be the swimming pool, the bandstand is pontoon boat. Um, it's it's just kitschy and corny. It, has, it is so tacky, it comes out the other side and has classy. 